Well, welcome again uh, to Venture Christian Church. Um, as a guy asked me to speak this morning, a couple weeks ago, I started thinking about, you know, you think about what you're going to say and how you're going to introduce things and why you were asked and all that stuff that goes through your mind. And, uh, and as I thought about this, I thought about my, uh, my high school government class. And uh, in high school government, you guys remember sitting in government class, we learn all about, you know, the president and the vice president and all these things. The order of, we learn about this thing called the order of succession or the line of succession. And, and uh, so they have the president and his backup is the vice president. So if something happens to the president, you know, the, the vice president, then it goes down to the speaker of house, of the house, and, and all the way down the line down to the janitor at the White House, I think, is the last line of defense if, if all these people are out of there. Well, guy asked me to speak because, well, our lead pastor is in Panama right now. And uh, the guy that would have backed up, he's in Panama as well. So I placed myself somewhere between the speaker of the house and the janitor here at Venture Christian Church. And so, so somewhere in there in that order um, is where you get me. So, so I, I'm glad you're here this morning. Uh, my name is Brent. If you don't know me, I know most of you. I have some new people here this morning. Um, I'm an elder here on our elder board. And, and uh, ask me what that means later, <laughs> if, if you're wondering. And, uh, and uh, I'll tell you. I'll be glad to tell you what that means. Um, we're going through a series right now in First John, and, uh, and Pastor Guy has entitled it Assurance. Assurance, and how that we can know that we actually know God. How can we actually know that we know God? And in this, in this, uh, and, and so we're going through this book, First John. It's a letter that John wrote. The Apostle John was a guy that, that knew Jesus well, and we look at the Gospel of John, um, uh, the book of John, and he lived his life with Jesus. Those three years that Jesus was in ministry, he lived close to him. And he knew Jesus very well. Um, a lot of traditions say that when he wrote this letter, he was actually one of the last people on this earth that actually walked and knew Jesus because he lived so, to such an old age. People didn't live in their 90s back then very often, but John did. John lived to an old age. And he was one of the only per- people on the earth that actually walked with Jesus, that actually knew Jesus. And so he wrote this letter to, uh, to a church, probably, probably in Ephesus, the church in Ephesus and, and, and the specific church, but those, those letters were meant to go out into all the churches and all over the world. And so there's two st- distinct differences between the books that John wrote, though. The Gospel of John is very evangelistic, talking about the life of Jesus. And when, it, when that book is given to someone and they read it, it is made to bring them to Jesus. The whole point of that book is John is talking about this man that came to take care of our sin and that he went to the cross and that, that you as a man can receive this free gift of salvation. We think of John 3.16 and, and all those awesome verses about the gospel, uh, about Jesus Christ. It was very evangelical. But when we look at the book of 1 John, it's a little different. You can read the book of 1 John and get the gospel out of it. I could go and, and, and take the book of 1 John, if that's all I had, and I could go to someone that was not a believer, and I could preach the gospel to them with the information, the truth that is revealed in that book. But that was not the purpose of the book of 1 John. Toward the end of his life, he knew these people he was writing to, and he knew the message that they needed. We're, gonna read the, we're actually going to read that in a minute. You're jumping ahead there. <laughs> I'll have you come up and read it for me there. <laughs> so, uh, all right, where was I? Thanks for that. Um, when, when, John, when John wrote the book of 1 John, he was writing to people assuming that they already knew Jesus. When we read this book and we're sitting, if you're sitting there in your devotion or whatever, when we read different parts of the book, we need to know who they were written to. And this was written assuming that you were already saved. You had already come to the point in your life where Jesus had been revealed to you. You had received the Holy Spirit. You're on your way to heaven. You're good. All right? That's who he's written it to. So when, when we read this, we read it with that perspective. So go ahead and turn in your Bibles if you have them. Um, I like to have a nice Bible with paper in it. And uh, I know we have our phones, you know, and they just read for us, as, as Scott has proven there. But, uh, but if you would, <laughs> I like to get in the habit of reading the Bible because sometimes when I just have my phone and, and my computer and stuff like that, I forget how to use this. And I, so I want to encourage you guys, it's going to be on the screen, I know you have a phone, but if you have a Bible, pull it out, there's one in front of you, you have, go to the book of 1 John, it's right in the end, the last few books of the Bible, and we're going to be reading in John chapter 2, and I just want to read this passage to you, in John, in 1 John chapter 2, starting in verse 3, and we're going to go all the way through verse 14 this morning, and then we'll, we'll kind of pick that apart and see what uh, John has to say to us this morning. 
the book of first john chapter 2 verse 3 and it says by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments whoever says i know him but does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him but whoever keeps his word in him truly the love of god is perfected by this we may know that we are in him Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which Jesus walked. Verse 7 says, Beloved, I am writing to you no new commandment, but an old one. An old commandment that you, you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I am writing to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Whoever says he is in the light And hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light. And in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother in the darkness. And walks in the darkness. And does not know where he is going. He does not know where he is going. Because the darkness has blinded his eyes. I am writing to you little children. Because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. I am writing to you fathers. Because you know him who is from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. And I write to you, young men, because you are strong. And the word of God abides in you. And you have overcome the evil one. Let's pray. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you that, uh, that this guy, John, that you inspired him to write this down for us today. I know it was written to some people a long time ago, but God, that you've preserved it and you've given this to us, this message to us. God, I pray as we, we continue to look through this book, God, that we can have that assurance, that knowledge that we truly know who you are and that we are actually part of you, we abide in you, and we, we can have confidence in that. So this morning, as we read through this passage, as we study it together, God, I pray that you would encourage us, encourage our hearts that we can know that we know you. Amen. All right, so let's, let's get started here. The question that we've been asking here is this, this question of assurance. This how do we know? How can you be sure that you know? And John answers that question for us. There's a lot of passages in the Bible that we can debate about. that are fun to debate about sometimes. And there's little nuances like I believe I'm on this side and I'm over here. And it's kind of fun to talk about those things. But it's awesome when the Bible comes out, when a writer in Scripture comes out and says, this is exactly what I want you to know. This is something that you can't argue with. This is something that I'm going to tell you right now that you can take to the bank because it's true. And there's no gray area. It says this. It says this in, in verse 3. I'll just read it for you. It says, it says, and by this we know that we have come to know him. Isn't that the question we've been asking? That's the question. We, that we, how do we have assurance? By this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Not the, not the answer we were expecting, is it? The answer that I expect when I ask, well, how, if I'm going to tell somebody, you know, how do you know that you're saved? How do you know that you know the right thing? You know, there's so many options out here. How do you know? For me, I want to, I want to feel good about it. Did you guys want to feel good about your faith? I want to, I want to, I want to come to a point where, you know, I, I just know that God's with, I feel the spirit in my chest and I can just feel him with me. I can feel him moving. You ever listen to a song? like at church or something, you're just singing along, and then all of a sudden it just hits you. And, you, and, 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 you, and you, you just, you're consumed by the Spirit of God. I love that. I live for that. That's not the best way to tell, is what John's saying. That can, that go, because that goes away, because I have to leave here and I have to go back to my life. It ain't about it at all. That's not the best way to tell. He says, if you obey my commandments, the next verse says, whoever says I know him but does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. Now, I want to be careful here, though, to tell you, because, because when, we, when, when someone like me stands up here and starts telling you, okay, you need to keep the commandments of God, I'm going to tell you how to live your life as a Christian, and uh, this is what Christians do, and this is what Christians do not do. What I'm not saying is that you need to do those things, those commandments of God, to be saved. I would never tell you that there's certain things that you have to accomplish before God is going to give you grace. You have to believe in him, confess his name, and you're saved. I would never say anything different than that. It's not for your salvation. It's not to gain favor with God. It's not because, you know, I want to I make God happy today, which is a good thing. We should all do things because of that. That's not the main reason that I do those things. 
to get favor with God. You have favor with God. Jesus showed that. He showed that on the cross because he, while you were yet sinners, he died for you. He loved you more than you could ever imagine anybody loving you. Another thing it is not for is to keep your salvation. We preach that, that, that salvation is a free gift from God all the time. It's a free gift. You can't do anything. And then we spend our whole lives trying to keep it. We serve a God that gives us a free gift of salvation. But he also gives us assurance in that salvation. The reason I'm doing these commandments is not to keep my salvation. I'm afraid that I'm going to lose it if I screw up what I'm doing here today. Because we serve a God that's bigger than that. Bigger than me screwing up today. So the question is, if it's not for my salvation, and it's not for keeping my salvation, all the things, what is it for? But also, which commandments? Whenever I think about the word commandments in the Bible, I think about the Ten Commandments, right? Ten Commandments. So God gave us Ten Commandments back in the Old Testament, gave it to the nation of Israel. That's only ten things. That should be pretty easy, right? Anybody struggle with any of those? So that does not answer my question either because I have the same response. It's like, that doesn't make sense. I can't keep all of his commandments. In fact, we hear in the New Testament when Jesus talks about the Old Testament, talks about the Old Testament commandments, the law of God, said that it, we learned that that never saved anybody. But what that did is it showed that you, that you weren't good enough to keep the law. It showed that sin. It took that sin in your life and it said if there was no law, there was, you wouldn't know you were a sinner. If I never told you that something was wrong, you wouldn't know that it was wrong, and that's what the law was there for. So which commandments do we look at then? If this passage in 1 John and John is teaching, a guy that knew Jesus told us, this is how you're going to know that you're in him, that you keep your, his commandments, that you walk as he did. Which commandments do we keep? One of my favorite commandments in the Old Testament, I read this when I was in high school, when I was just getting into the Old Testament. You start reading the Old Testament, you're like, this is just really weird. There's weird stuff in the Old Testament. There's stuff that we don't talk about. There's stuff about, you know, gory stuff, like, like you don't want your kids to watch on TV. And, but here's the Bible. Read the Bible, kids, you know, and, and, and stuff like that. And, and I remember reading through the, these things and all the dietary laws and the commandments and the one that stuck with me, and I don't know why, but it said, that it said something to affect that don't boil a goat in its mother's milk. I don't know. I'm not a Jewish guy. I don't know what that means and why that was important. But every time I think of commandments, I think of that. I'm thinking like, okay, so is it okay to some, some other goat's milk? Or why would I? I <laughs> so I, I get a little confused by that because I wasn't in that. That's a cultural thing, and it wasn't my time. So, so there's all these commandments. And sometimes we get lost in those things because, because on one side, you, you get people that are pretty legalistic about it and say you have to keep the commandments. You have to keep this. You have to keep the Sabbath. You have to keep all these things to be a believer. That was happening in this time as well. And you have people on the other side of the thing that says, no, the Old Testament isn't for us. The Old Testament's obsolete. Jesus took care of all that. You don't need it. So what do we do? Well, we look. I think we need to look at what Jesus thought about the Old Testament. And for one thing, man, the Old Testament is for us, guys. I just want to let you know that. That's, that's the side I'm on. Now, that's, that's where we learn about who God is and how he interacts with people. We learn about the nature of God and every, everything we know about God before Jesus, we learn from the Old Testament. And so, so when, I, when I think about this commandment and we go back there, I'm going to turn to the book of Deuteronomy. And if you can find it, find it. It's in the Old Testament near the beginning of your Bible. And when, when, when John says, he goes, I'm writing you a commandment and not a new commandment, but one that you've had from the beginning. This is the one I thought of. And I think this is what, he, what he's talking about when he talks about these commandments that we have to live in our lives. And, and this is something that we hear a lot. And, but I want you to think about this commandment, and we'll read some passages in the New Testament as well. In, in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your, our God, the Lord is one. Verse 5 says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk to them when you sit in your house. And when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. You guys, that's a long time before John was ever even the picture. God gave his people a commandment. He said, you need to follow everything that I say. You need to, you need to, it says you need to talk about it with your kids. You need to, it says you need to, they took it literally, the, a lot of the Pharisees and stuff, they had these big boxes they put between their eyes because God said so. 
He said, you need to tie it on your doorpost. You ever seen those on people's doorposts? You see the scrolls? That's what that's about. He said, you need to take these things I'm going to command you, and you need to do them in your life, all these things. And what's the one most important thing that he said? It wasn't about goats and about dietary things and about shellfish and all that stuff that we get confused about. It was the one thing that he said. He said, you need to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. He said, you need to love the Lord your God. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 22. Jesus comes into the scene, and these guys that know all about those laws, they know all about those more than I'll ever know, and they lived that. They lived, they lived in this Old Testament law. They, these were the Pharisees, the, the people that, that their job, their whole purpose in this world was to know the law of God. And they didn't like Jesus because he was stealing their thunder a little bit, and they came to Jesus and they, they tried to catch him on this one. Because different sects of Jews disagreed on what was the greatest commandment, how you, how you should live your life, what things are important as a Jew. And in verse 36 of chapter 22 of the Gospel of Matthew, it says this, Teacher, which is the, the great commandment in the law? Which one's the best? They should have read their Bible and read Deuteronomy that we just did, and it said this is the greatest. But they're trying to catch him. And he said this, and he said to him, this is Jesus, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And this is the great and first commandment. When John said, I'm giving you this commandment, I'm writing to you that you would follow these commandments, it's not a new commandment that I'm giving you, it's an old one. It was thousands of years before John ever came. And it was, it was, it was decades before that that Jesus brought that up again and said, you know what, I'm not giving you a new commandment either. You guys should know this. That the commandment I'm giving you is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, heart soul, mind, and strength. That's the commandment of God. And in, in, in Jesus' fashion, they asked him for one, but he gave them two. He said, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to one-up you on that one. I'm going to say, here's the best one, but I'm going to give you the second one because it's just like it. Verse 39 says, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, verse 40 is the kicker here because this is what he means when it's not a new command. This is an old commandment. It says this, on these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. He looks at these guys that were lawyers, these guys that were professionals in the law, the Jewish law, and he said, all that stuff you're doing, in, I'm going to sum up your whole life, your whole existence, your purpose in this Jewish community with two things. Everything that you've learned your whole life rests upon this thing I'm going to say to you right now. And he says, you need to love the Lord your God with all your whole heart. Every part of your being, you need to love God. And you need to turn to your neighbor, and you need to love him just the same way. They're like, well, that wasn't the answer we wanted. That's, that's not good. That, does, that, mess, that, that doesn't fix our argument at all. And part of that that was new, though, we, we, we read in 1 John. If you go back to 1 John with me, when he starts talking about how we should treat our brothers, Verse 8, it says, at the same time, it is a new commandment that I am writing to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Verse 9 says, whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in the darkness. He's saying you can follow all the commandments you want in this world. You show hate to people around you. That first verse, how do you know? You keep my commandments, you're not doing it. You're not keeping the, the, the best thing. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. He's saying that it's, it's impossible for us to love God and not love everybody else. That's an impossibility in the world of salvation, in the world of God, in the world of being in him, in the world of walking as Jesus walked. That's an impossibility for me to say that I love God so much. I'm going to devote my whole life to God, but I don't like any of you. I can't say that. What did it say? It says I'm a liar. That's a strong word to call someone a liar. Better be sure that 
that's what that's what Jesus said. That's what John the Apostle said. But if you live your life in that way, you're not living in him. The truth is not in you. You walk in darkness and you don't know where you're going. In this passage, John is answering the question that we've been asking, and he's going to continue to answer that question. John is answering the question, how can I be sure, with another question. The answer that he gives, he says, what does your life look like? How are you living your life for Jesus? And that, look at that, and that'll be your answer. How do you react to the commandments of God? The way that you act toward God and his commandments will show you that you know the right thing, that you're in him. How do you respond to it when God is leading you in your life somewhere? Are you resistant to that, or do you go with the spirit of God? The way that you react to God shows you your faith. The way that we love our brothers and sisters in Christ will give us that answer. Let's forget about all those people that don't come to church on Sunday. Those people are hard to deal with. You know what? Sometimes it's harder to deal with people close to us. You know why? Because we know a lot about people that are close to us. I know a lot about your lives, probably too much about some of your lives. All right? Some, to, some of those things make it hard to love people because they're messed up, screwed up people, and they've got all these issues, and I'd rather not talk to them about it. Sometimes it's easier for me to go to the grocery store and say, God bless you, brother, as I leave. And that's me loving my neighbor because I don't have to deal with him again. That was way easier than, than, than me actually getting into someone's life and talking to them, and ministering to them, and praying with them. That's way easier. But also the way that we do love our neighbor. Because sometimes it's easier to love you guys, because you guys give me a break sometimes when I screw up too. Sometimes it's hard to go out there and love people that are just dirty, gross people. There's a bunch of kids in Panama right now that aren't, probably aren't very pleasant people. They live up in the hills. They're probably dirty. They're probably that getting baptized is more bait than they've done in a while. But those people took time out of their day, their week, their month, took vacation, and went over there and served those people. No, those are our neighbors, too. They're a long ways away. There's the people that we work with, the people that we do run into at the grocery store. It's another impossibility. If I walk around this town saying that I love God, I love Jesus, I have a Jesus sticker on my car and all those things, that I'm a jerk to people when I meet them? There's your answer. That's how you know. Has the gospel that you have heard and claim to believe in actually changed the way you live today? The way, the way that you live when you walked up and you walked in here this morning? Or if you're hearing it for the first time, has it changed you and you're going to leave here and be a different person? I want to read a, a passage out of a book. As I was studying this week, I, I picked, I was thumbing through a, a, a book that I've read a couple times in the past, and uh, just encouraging book uh, by a guy named Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He was a, a pastor of a church in Germany. He was put into a prison camp because of his faith, and he accomplished more in that prison camp than he ever did on the outside. He wrote books and letters and poetry and, and things that were smuggled out. Uh, at one time, a bunch of his followers actually paid off some guards got in there, we're going to smuggle him out. And he said, this is my church in here. What are, what are these people going to do if I leave? Um, there's a lot of people out there writing books about how you should live your life, and then they keep writing more books and more books. But uh, this guy wrote these, these things while he was in prison, th and uh, he died believing those things that he wrote down. He was executed in a prison. And it, the book was called Cost of Discipleship. And he, and, and, and he paid the, the ultimate price. He died for his people. But this is the last page in that book. The cost of discipleship. He's, he's described what it is to be a disciple, how to follow God. I just want to read this to you because it, it, it touches on just kind of the heart of John and how you, why, how you should live your life. It says this. It says, now we understand why the New Testament always speaks to our becoming like Christ. We have been transformed into his, the image of Christ and therefore destined to be like him. He is the only pattern we must follow. And because he really lived his life in us, we too can walk even as he walked. Do as he do has done. Love as he has loved. Forgive as he forgave. Have his mind, which was also in Christ Jesus, and therefore we are able to follow the example he has left for us. Lay down our lives for the brethren as he did. It is only because he became like us 
that we can become like him. And it is only because we are identified with him that we can become like him. I got saved when I was in high school. I met Jesus in a real way when I was in high school. I was a freshman in high school. Actually, I was, it, was the, it was the year before my freshman year. Um, I was wrestling. I was a wrestling team in the, in the eighth grade. And uh, my, uh, my, the head coach and the assistant coach ended up being uh, the youth pastor and his assistant for my grandpa's church. And uh, they found out that I was Glenn Bradford's grandson. And they had a mission, and they started praying for me. Behind my back, I didn't know. They'd stay after practice, and they'd pray for Brent. And, uh, and because they knew that my grandpa was praying for me and stuff, and they were kind of talking behind my back, and so I didn't let me in on it. But, uh, <laughs> but those, guys, those guys prayed for me, and, man, I, I, it was about like six months after school, or, uh, after that, I, I got saved. I, I met Jesus. I got saved at McDonald's, of all places. I'll tell you that story some other time. I egg McMuffin tears, and <laughs> it was, was, was kind of ugly, but, but it worked. You know, God works in that way, too. Um, but <laughs> at that point, I got saved. There's this guy, that our youth pastor at that time. I started getting involved with youth ministry. And I remember as we walked into the youth room, I could picture it. And it was um, it was called the Crosswalk Youth Ministry is what it was called. And it was it was in the middle of the 90s, so it was bright, hot pink and bright, hot green on the wall, the whole wall. And it said Crosswalk Youth Ministry. And it said, and it said this verse. It was 1 John 2, 6 in our passage today. It says, whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. And from that time, from me being a baby Christian and just learning about who Jesus was, it was instilled in me, that verse. If you're going to claim to be in him, you need to walk as if you really believe it. If you really believe that today that you are saved, you believe you have the assurance that you are saved today. I do. And that's because it was taught to me. The truth of the word was taught to me. I want to end with uh, a couple verses that we haven't touched on. If you open your Bibles again to 1 John and, and these last few verses, I want to just encourage you because that's what John did. He wrote him some pretty heavy things, calling them liars, saying that if you're living this way, you're not, you have no part in it. You're not even, if, I would never do this, but he was an apostle. But he said, you're not, he pretty much told us, he said, you're not saved. You don't know. But then he encourages them, and I want to leave you with these words that John said. In verse, verse uh, 12 of chapter 2 of 1 John, he says this. He says, I am writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, children, because you know. Sorry, I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, children, because you know the Father. And I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. And I write to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. John writes this to a group of people that were saved to encourage them, not to discourage them, not to tear them down, but to build them up and say, you are saved. You can have assurance. You can be confident in what you believe in because these things are true. And I believe that's the word that John has for us this morning. Let's pray. God, I thank you for, uh, God, just the opportunity to, uh, to listen to your word, God, to study your word. God, the fact that you've preserved it for us from thousands of years ago, even back in, 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 in way in the Old Testament, those, those passages that, that still mean so much to us. God, I pray that you would just work on our hearts this morning. God, t- continue to teach us how it is that we should live, and I pray that anybody that is claiming to, to, to walk in him, to be in Jesus, to abide in you, is walking just as you walked. And I pray that you would just give us the strength every day to do that. God, as we leave here, God, I pray that our lives would be changed. The way that we live our lives is changed because of the truth that we have. And I just pray this in your name.